Good afternoon and welcome to the Middle East Forum speaker webinar series and podcast. I'm Stacey Roman and I will be moderating this discussion today. We're pleased to have Michael Eisenstadt, Director of Military and Security Studies at the Washington Institute for Near Eastern Policy, join us to discuss deterring Iran in the gray zone. Mr. Eisenstadt will speak for 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I will turn the discussion over to Mr. Michael Eisenstadt. Thank you much, uh, very much, Stacy, and uh, to release forum for the invite. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm looking forward to talking to you today about a topic which is the subject of a um, study that I just published through the Washington Institute on the whole issue of gray zone deterrence vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran. The reason I wrote that is that piece because I've, I've been working on the whole kind of Iranian uh, gray zone strategies kind of um, piece for over a year now. But it seems to me that deterrence for a long time, um, deterrence has been a topic on which um, American capabilities have kind of grown rusty. Um, a lot of our experience in conducting deterrence has been influenced by our experience during the Cold War uh, with regard to nuclear deterrence. And that's a whole different, a really different can of beans. And even gray zone deterrence is a different can of beans than conventional deterrence, traditional conventional deterrence. So I thought um, I'd write a paper on this. So anyhow, um, Stacey, if you could bring up the slides. Um, I have a PowerPoint uh, show here. And if you could go to the next um, slide, please. So basically, first of all, a little bit of introduction about Iran's kind of way of war. Bottom line is Iran's um, preferred way of war is not conventional war. Um, the United States way preferred way of war is conventional war. When Americans talk about war, they think about go big or go home, decisive, decisive battle, um, using overwhelming force. Iran's way of war is completely different. First of all, their preferred way of war is gray zone activities. And I'll define that a little bit more in a minute. Um, they will wage conventional war if necessary. So they fought a bloody eight-year war against Iraq because they were invaded. They also fought a conventional, a quasi-conventional war in Syria because from their point of view, their main regional ally was um, um, embattled and, and threatened by American, Zionist, and Saudi conspiracy to undermine the axis of resistance. And the, and the um, environment was conducive to operating conventionally. There, there was no threat to Iranian force except that posed by uh, the re rebels. And their, prefer their preference for gray zone activities is not based on a transitory calculation, but it's a deeply rooted aspect of their regime st strategic culture, which was reinforced by their experience in the Iran-Iraq war, which they never, that kind of experience of a, a, a meat grinder conventional wars is not something they ever want to repeat again. So they prefer, you know, the, the, the gray zone modus operandi is not unique to Iran. It's used by um, China and Russia as well. It's generally used by anti-status quo powers who want to advance their interests while avoiding escalation and, and, and preventing war. So, and also it's usually used by adversaries who tend to see conflict as a continuum. Americans see conflict as, you know, there's war and there's peace. And if we're in peace, we're limited in terms of our options. And this creates a gray zone in between war and peace in which that, that countries like Iran are able to um, exploit. It depends on incrementalism, the use of proxies or unacknowledged unilateral activities and avoiding decisive engagement with the enemy. You want to avoid becoming decisively engaged in, in, a, in a, um, uh, a conflict or a clash that could escalate. So they'll always test and probe to determine the adversary's response thresholds. They'll engage in both lethal and non-lethal testing activities. Um, they will space and pace their activities in order to limit the potential for escalation, to limit the threat uh, perceived by the adversary. Um, but bottom line is the whole gray zone modus operandi is designed to defeat the adversary's deterrence efforts. Okay? It's all about defeating the adversary's de deterrence efforts. I will also just say that it's very commonsensical really. It was so simple, it's so simple. The whole idea underlying gray zone is so simple that my, my kid brother understood it when we were growing up. So I'd be sitting at my desk doing my homework and he would come to the threshold of my room, stand right by the doorway, and start making noise, you know, and trying to annoy me and trying to get my attention. And I'd be trying to ignore him doing my homework. 
And they would start throwing like little rolled up pieces of paper at me and I'd skip across my desk and I'd try to ignore it. And they'd step one step into my room and one step back, two steps in, two steps back, and then three steps in. So finally, that was it. He crossed my, thresh, my response threshold. I, I, I get up and start running after him. And he starts shouting, Ma, Dad, Mike's chasing me. So I'd hear a voice from that, you know, downstairs, Mike, you know, leave your brother alone. And he'd be, I'd be chasing after him and he's running to his room and he'd have his door slightly open. So he had his basically anti-axis area denial array ready. He would slide into his room, close the door and lock it. So I couldn't, I couldn't catch him. So it was all the elements of a gray zone. He would test limits. Then when I would respond, he would play the victim and try to get great power intervention on his behalf. And then he would rely on anti-access airy denial arrays, that, that is the door to his room, to prevent me from reaching him. Okay? So it's all, it's, you know, the only difference between kids play and the real way that real world great power actors work is that countries like Iran don't have great power patrons that they could call on. Um, uh, you know, and the whole idea is not to actually provo provoke a response. My brother wanted the excitement of the chase. Real world gray zone actors don't wanna be chased. They don't wanna elicit a response if possible. Okay, next page. So what have we learned from 40 years of gray zone, attempting gray zone deterrence against Iran? And, and I would say largely, or to, to a great extent, um, um, efforts that have yielded at best a mixed result and very often have been unsuccessful. First of all, Iran is a learning adaptive actor. I mentioned the constant testing and probing. You know, that's one aspect in order to learn the adversary's re response threshold. That's one, one element of the learning piece. They also, if we look at, for instance, Iran's behavior during its efforts to counter America's maximum pressure campaign, starting in May of 2018, uh, 2018 actually May of 2019, um, they started off with simple attacks. That is, they, um, conducted limpid mine attacks against ships that were at anchor. And then the month after they did limpid mine attacks against ships that were moving. And they then finally ended with um, attacks on Saudi um, oil uh, facilities in Abqaiq and El Quares using um, cruise missiles um, and drones from multiple launch points, probably in Southwestern Iran and maybe Iraq, okay? And they went from non-lethal activities in terms of harassment rocket fire in Iraq to lethal activities when they finally killed an American in December with rocket fire. Also for Iran, managing risk is paramount, okay? I mentioned before the testing and probing to, to, to determine adversary response thresholds. So <clears throat> they'll do that. That's a way of managing risk. They rely on proxies. That's a way of, another way of managing risk because generally the United States does not respond against Iran when its proxy does something, but we respond against a proxy. And again, we did that in Iraq and Syria um, with Iran's counterpressure campaign against maximum pressure. We hit the uh, Qatar Hezbollah, um, so, uh, I think a couple of times, um, not, not uh, Iran itself until we finally killed Qasem Soleimani and a little bit more about that in a minute. And they'll do things in order to limit the impact of their actions. So for instance, the limpet mine attacks that I mentioned before were not intended to sink the ships, but to cause damage to the hulls. And likewise, the attack on the Aramco facility in September of 2019 was designed um, to not kill anybody. It was just to do material damage. Okay. Even the retaliation for the Qasem Soleimani killing, they could have killed Americans and it was, they, were, they were accepting much more risk in this case. But even so, in that situation, they alerted the Iraqis that they were gonna conduct a retaliatory strike probably knowing that the Iraqis were going to tell the Americans, which would give us time in order to you know, uh, have our personnel take shelter in order to limit the damage that the retaliation would do, okay? It's also very complex and challenging, gray zone deterrence, because very often we're trying to compel Iran while we're also trying to deter. And sometimes those efforts might work at cross purposes. So for instance, under maximum pressure, we were trying to use sanctions to pressure Iran to come back to negotiations with us so we could negotiate a new deal about nuclear as well as Iran's 12 areas that you know, Secretary of State Pompeo said that you know, we were expecting change in order to you know, allow for a, a more normal Iran. But the pressure then, you know, we got to a point in May of 2019 where 
when we were finally trying to, we took the steps in April of 2019 to bring down their oil exports to zero, we put Iran in a situation where they felt that um, if they didn't lash out militarily, um, that they were on a slippery slope um, and that basically um, they would simply be emboldening uh, the United States and encouraging more action. So they lashed back militarily. So basically our, our efforts to compel Iran actually undermine our extra efforts to deter them because we put them in a situation where they felt that um, they're in, they are actually were incentivized to strike back at us in order to cause us to ease up on our compellence efforts and thereby, you know, our, our, our red line of, um, you know, don't kill any Americans, um, you know, they eventually got to that point in December of 2019 when they killed an American, but they, we, we put them in a situation where they felt a need to strike back militarily in order to um, ease up or, or try to, you know, exert counter pressure on the United States so we would ease up on our compellence efforts with maximum pressure, okay. Um, deterrence efforts are often, often, are also often short-lived, okay. So, for instance, after killing Qasem Soleimani, and you know, an action that was described as an attempt to restore deterrence, Iran responded with unilateral you know, um, missile strike five days later, and for almost all of January, there were attacks, much higher level of attacks on U.S. facilities in Iraq than we had seen in any previous period, and then it, and then they decreased dramatically for several months afterwards. So bottom line is, you never really restore deterrence. Deterrence is always going to be contested. And the adversary is always going to be testing to see ways in which um, he can undermine your deterrence. And then finally, the potential for war is greatly overstated. I said that the whole gray zone modus operandi is guided by a desire in order to avoid war. Um, and therefore, all this talk that the United States and Iran were on the brink of war, I think, is uh, it's not even a gross exaggeration, it's just wrong. I don't think we were on the brink of war. There was the potential for much greater escalation, but not war, and that's a, and that's a big difference. Next page, please. And this is uh, my final point here. I have just a few minutes left. Um, so what do we learn here about, um, you know, how we can perhaps more effectively deter Iran? The first of all, the first of all, I just, the most important thing to, to, to understand is that you're not yet, never going to succeed 100% deterring in the gray zone. Because of asymmetries in motivation and focus, for instance, the United States is a great power that has worldwide commitments. We're not going to be able to respond to every Iran, uh, Ir Iranian provocation. Okay, And that inherently gives them a certain freedom of action. On the other hand, though, because of our escalation superiority and, and because of the damage that Iran knows that we can do to them, we can deter their most destabilizing or more, most destructive activities. So for instance, like I, I mentioned, a lot of Iran's activities were non-lethal, were intended to be non-lethal. So that in itself is to some extent a deterrent success. But the fact that for instance, for seven months, we did not respond to Iranian harassment, rock, harassing rocket fire in Iraq against us, embolden Iran, cause them to increase the intensity and tempo of their rocket attacks and led then in December to the killing of an American. So again, there's a, um, there's a balance to be struck that you, you can't, you know, you probably don't have the bandwidth to, re to, to respond to everything, but if you don't respond more frequently and more unpredictably, you're likely to embolden the adversary and eventually bring about the situation that you're trying to avoid, which is escalation. And again, that's what happened with the United States in Iran, um, in, in Iraq, um, during the fall of 2019, where we, for seven months, we didn't respond to rocket attacks. They kind of ramped them up in November, December, the intensity, the numbers of the rocket attacks until they killed an American. We responded by killing about 25 Qatar Hezbollah militiamen. And in response to that, the Iranians had a protest in front of the US embassy. That brought it back all kinds of memories of Hobart, uh, excuse me, of the occupation of the American embassy in Tehran in 1979, the killing of Ambassador Chris Stevens in um, Libya in 2012. And in response, we kill, ended up killing Qasem Soleimani. 
But again, both sides felt that they didn't want to escalate further and both sides communicated to each other, both through the Swiss channel diplomatically and publicly through Twitter that both sides considered the case, you know, the, the, the file closed at least temporarily and they de-escalated, de which, you know, brings me to another point, communicating. There are times when it's good to be unpredictable because that plays on the adversary, in this case, Iran's, um, uh, you know, desire to manage risk. Um, but there's also time to be, to clarify, to set expectations, to clarify intentions. And some, and, and there's also sometimes um, it's, there's a time to be auda audacious, such as the killing of Qasem Soleimani. And there's a time to be restrained, for instance, not responding to Iran's retaliatory action. Okay. And let me just, I know I'm running out of my time here. So I just, one or two more quick points <coughs> related to some of the points here I wrote with regard to capability and credibility. America seems to always think that if you have an aircraft carrier in the Gulf, it's gonna deter. And I actually have put together a chart, which I'm not quite done with, but it basically shows that some of Iran's most destabilizing actions occurred when, it, when we had an aircraft carrier in the Persian Gulf. So they're not deterred by simply the presence of large amounts of forces that are forward. They're deterred by the credibility of American threats. And if they don't think that those forces will be used, they won't, um, they, they won't be deterred. So you need to have both credibility, you have to focus and understand how your adversary sees you, as well as having the capability in place. And we haven't paid enough attention to that in the past. I mentioned before, we need to respond more consistently to Iranian challenges, but they're always testing to see what our response thresholds are. And if we don't respond, they'll become more emboldened. Um, and we also have to be more unpredictable how we act because risk management is so important to them that if we're constantly unpredictable, it makes it more difficult to assess risk. And as a result, I think they'll be more um, conservative and risk averse in their decision-making. Um, and then the final point, and I'll stop and I'll open it up to questions, is the whole issue of denial and punishment. America has consistently focused by and large on deterrence, what we call deterrence by denial, conveying to the adversary that no matter what you do, we will prevent you from achieving your goals. So if you plant mines, we will sweep the mines. If you shoot missiles or rockets at us, we will intercept the missiles and rockets. You won't achieve, achieve your goals. And the bottom line is there's no cost that the adversary pays when you play the game that way. If you also have a punishment component that you will impose costs on them, not just their proxies, but the adversary itself, then you will are more likely to more reliably deter them. And again, that's what I think we effectively accomplished with the killing of Qasem Soleimani. Even though at the time I was against it, I thought it was unnecessarily escalatory. That's the whole thing about this kind of thing. You learn about what the adversary tolerances are by doing, by acting. And we learned as a result of the killing of Qasem Soleimani that it had a real, um, it, it, it really um, had a um, chilling effect on the Iranians. It had a devastating psychological effect on them. And as a result, after killing them, they were quiet for a few months and they started testing again. And when we convey the threat that we were willing to close our embassy, that they continued the rocket attacks, that combined with the legacy of the killing of Qasem Soleimani convinced them that we were willing to throw off the gloves. And plus also with elections approaching, they thought that perhaps President Trump would be um, in, uh, motivated to you know, hit Iran hard in the, in the run up to elections um, uh, because it would give them a bump at the polls. That's at least I think that their, their fear was. So as a result, through the, through the you know, run up to the elections, there was a, a, an increase in Iranian activity during the summer and then the run up to the elections, they stopped almost everything. So that was, again, a good example of how deterrence is always contested, that you can never assume you're going to have a, um, uh, you know, deterrence net, you won't, won't be um, restored. It's only restored very temporarily, and then you will be tested again. But there are ways by conveying um, uh, uh, credible threats by which you can, and, and you, you are able to um, deter the adversary but the threats have to be constantly communicated. And on that, I will close and I will look forward to discussing this issue with you or answering your questions. So thank you very much. And if you want a fuller um, discussion of this, of this issue, the paper is available online. So thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. So the first question we have in is from David Levine. 
Can you talk about the implications of a Trump first Biden presidency regarding the matters you raised in your talk about Iran's behavior? Yeah, I mean, first of all, we have seen after uh, President Biden took office, we have seen a gradual increase in attacks in Iraq, for instance. But the Iranians have been doing it, and, and this goes back to the previous administration. You know, during the period that I think they were increasingly deterred by the, the, the possibility of, you know, President Trump throwing down the gloves before the elections for electoral reasons, they ramped up attacks in Iraq, but not rocket attacks. They did attacks on um, logistical convoys, which are manned by Iraqi contractors. So there was almost no chance of killing or hurting an, Amer an American by these attacks. And they've continued with that ratio of like 90% of their attacks are on logistical convoys in Iraq, and only about 10% of their attacks are rocket attacks. Although in the last few days, we've seen kind of a gradual increase in rocket attacks. There have been, I think last week, there were three days in a row they conducted a rocket attacks. And that's, that's kind of a, 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 sh a short temporary bump. So they might be changing the mix again to um, experimenting with more kind of um, more risk-taking behavior because perhaps they feel that the um, Biden administration, um, they want to test that their response thresholds and maybe the Biden administration is more committed to a diplomatic path and therefore might be constrained in how they respond to their provocations in Iraq. So it's still a little early, but we've seen a lot of continuity over how they've been acting with the Trump, uh, you know, how they acted with the Trump administration at the end um, with the mix of attacks. And we saw also, again, renewal of harassment in the Gulf of, of, of some of the warships. So kind of re return to some of their old, mod you know, modus operandi. Um, and we'll see how the, you know, Biden administration handles these things. Because again, if you don't respond, eventually, you know, you build in the adversary and they'll, put, they'll try to push the boundaries. Thank you. The next question in is from Len Goetz. It seems Iran is on the path to acquire a nuclear weapon. Do you think it will eventually acquire one? And if it did, do you think Iran will use it? And under what circumstances would that yeah. be? I mean, first of all, let me just say, Iran has the longest standing nuclear weapons program in the world without yet yielding a weapon as far as we know. Um, so it's been going on since the mid eighties. So this is not a crash program. I think the Iranians are actually very, um, uh, you know, torn on this issue. On the one hand, I think they would very much like to have nuclear weapons. It's very clear they've been doing weapons work. The IAEA, IAEA has verified this in, in numerous reports. The Israeli Mossad, you know, with the documents they, they, they brought out of Iran in 2018, kind of uh, documented that. But they don't want to be North Korea either. They don't want to be a country that's sanctioned, isolated. They really, they really want to avoid that outcome. And I think their preferred outcome, at least in the near to midterm, of course, you know, if they go back, you know, into compliance with the JCPOA, that'll this will limit their options for a while, um, most likely. But um, you know, in the long term, I think, or in the, in the midterm, they would like to be a threshold nuclear power, which means that they have the ability to acquire nuclear weapons if they take the decision, but they haven't done so because that gives you a lot of the cachet of a nuclear weapon state with actually the downside of being a nuclear weapon state. That said, with a different leader, if the Supreme Leader dies, or if you have a, you know, the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard, plays a greater role in the future in the decision-making than they have in the past, you might see a different calculus in the future with regard to weaponization versus a latent nuclear capability. So I would never say that this is always going to be their policy going forward. In terms of what they would do with a nuclear weapon if they had it, <coughs> again, my comment has to do with the current leadership you know, group, but different leaders could be different, different dynamics. The Supreme Leader, I think, has been very cautious in this regard, and I think his vision is you have nuclear weapons to use as a psychological weapon against your adversary um, to hold over their head as you know, potential for destruction, but on the ground, your action is done by militias, by proxy militias. So they've been trying to create kind of a ring of hostile militias around Israel. You have Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, you have Hamas, which is not an Iranian proxy, but it's armed and, and supported by Iran in Gaza. They were trying to set up um, kind of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Syrian mini Hezbollahs in, in, in Syria in order to threaten Israel from the Golan. And they would like, if they could, to provide arms to the Palestinians in the West Bank, but the Israelis and the Jordanians are not going to allow that. But that's their preference. And if they could plunge Israel into war, you know, every two or three years, or, you know, what happened a few hours ago in Jerusalem, to have rockets going down on Jerusalem from time to time, so that, you know, in the long run, 
people decide that you know th there are better places to live than Israel. Businesses won't want to do business in Israel and invest in Israel. And demography eventually, from their point of view, does its you know work, which which I don't think is going to happen because actually, if you look at fertility rates and, and and birth rates, you know actually Israel has high rates by you know by uh, Western standards, and the Palestinians in Israel and in the West Bank, their birth rates are way you know the fertility rates are way down. So there's not going to be you know Israel is not going to be overwhelmed demographically, but I, I I still think that's their kind of eventual hope. So the nuclear weapons, you know, helped create a, a, an atmosphere where eventually people leave Israel. Um, but again, in the future, if you have a different leadership, they might look at using using it. But keep in mind, if they use it, um, there won't be Iran left either. And that I think bears on on their uh, ways on them. My final point on this, you know, Bernard Lewis once said that um, mutual assured destruction doesn't work with Iran because it's something they would welcome. You know, the whole idea of you know kind of moderatism and the like something they would welcome. I, I disagree totally, at least with the leadership we've, been, we've, been, we've had um, in Iran since you know, 1989, the Supreme Leader Khamenei. Like I said, risk management is their guiding principle in everything they do. So it could be, that could change in the future, but thus far, you know, I think they're very cautious and they want nukes, but I, I think they want to use it more as a psychological warfare weapon and as a status symbol um, rather than you know, to actually use it. But that could change always in the future. Thank you. Our next question from Francois Labont. Uh, very interesting. Thank you, Michael. Uh, my question is, is there any value in economic sanctions in Iran? And is there any benefit to renegotiating and rejoining the Iran nuclear deal? Um, let me just say, first of all, sanctions got us to the negotiating table in 2015. I actually think that the Obama administration did a very good job at setting the, the table. I think they, my main critique is the actual negotiations themselves. I think they had a very strong hand that they squandered and got a very flawed deal as a result. So, um, you know, I don't have a disagreement with the idea of, you know, let's see if we can um, renegotiate the deal. Um, and I, I thought in the long run that if the JCPOA was implemented um, as written, that eventually we would have had to withdraw from the deal after say 10, 12, you know, 13 years, as Iran, if Iran, if Iran didn't change and was building up its civilian nuclear infrastructure, and, and then you know, in order to use that as a cover for a you know nuclear military nuclear program, it would have been in our interest to withdraw and reimpose all the sanctions on them at that time. But in life, timing is everything. And I think it was a mistake to withdraw from the deal when the Trump administration did, because it put us crosswise with our allies and it created a lot of friction. And in the end, it didn't work. And we're kind of in a mess now in a, in a very uh, undesirable situation where Iran is kind of building up. I don't think they intend to break out at this point, but you never know, you know, you just never know that, you know, their calculus could change. And we put ourselves in a situation where we are seen as the problem and not Iran, which is uh, kind of a uh, own goal. So again, in principle, I don't have, I'm not against the idea of negotiating a deal if you, if you can. But again, the um, sanctions didn't have enough time to work. You know, the Trump administration, maybe the Trump administration thought they were going to have two terms in order to use maximum pressure. They, they came at it late. They only implement, implemented maximum pressure in the middle of 2019. You know, that's like, um, you know, what, a, a year and a half already into their term. So they squandered a lot of time um, in implementing a policy that we know takes time to, to work. Sanctions take time to work. It took it took the last sanctions five years to work. So, you know, again, I, I think mistakes were made by both previous administrations and um, we should learn from it. You know, I, I think going forward, I think we're probably gonna get an unsatisfactory deal again. Um, you know, it may buy us some time and we have to use the time wisely this time. Um, and we'll see. Thank you. And our last question for the day is from Carrie Hildebrand. What red lines do each side have, does each side have where the gray zone provocations may escalate into open warfare? Well, let me just say, I want to make it clear, open warfare again, that the whole kind of vocabulary is not really appropriate um, for gray zone. We're trying to avoid open warfare because we have, first of all, we have the trauma of the US embassy hostage crisis in 78, uh, 79, 80, 81. We have the hostages in Lebanon in the 90s. 
We have 600 Americans killed by Iranian proxies um, you know, in, in Iraq um, after 2003. Iran has the trauma of the Iran-Iraq war. So neither side wants a war. Now you could say they could stumble into it. Um, I think both sides have shown in 40 years that they have a, the ability to manage this relationship pretty effectively. I would never say never, but so, um, you know, the red lines are, you know, for Americans, it's killing Americans, but I would argue it needs to be more than that. So attacks, you know, we've always said that um, we are, we support freedom of navigation and the free flow of oil at reasonable prices from the Gulf. That's always been a longstanding US red line. When we didn't respond to the um, Iranian strike on the Aramco facilities in September 29th, that was a, a walk back from a longstanding American policy that I think did damage to our standing in the region and internationally. And I think we need to restore that as uh, one of our red lines. So killing of Americans, free flow of oil from the region or threats to the free flow of oil. For Iran, you know, it's, it's threats to the survival of the regime, attacks on their, main, on their homeland and attacks on Iranian personnel, such as, you know, the killing of Soleimani or, or more, more junior personnel. Um, you know, keep in mind, you know, by and large, when we kill Qatar Hezbollah people, um, they don't they don't go back at us directly because that's the purpose of these proxies to die for Iran without endangering Iranian interests. So you know it's it's a matter of learning how to play this game, and and I think we've you know we still have a long way to go. And I hope my you know presentation today and the paper you know if you're interested in it, that you should read it will help us become more effective in coming up with our own gray zone strategy for dealing with Iran because I think that's the best way to deal to fight. Fires by you know is with fire in this case. I think that's the most effective reason. And plus, it's also much better in terms of our domestic politics and our relationships with our allies if we act covertly and quietly. It doesn't royal domestic politics. It doesn't royal Iraqi politics or or the Europeans. And it, well, well, thank you so much as well. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. And again, the paper that you mentioned uh, for our viewers that can be found in the bio section of our webinar invitation, should you wish to read that. But if you have any other work you'd like our viewers to know about, please feel free to share that now. Okay. No, it's just, um, I have, go to our, if, on our website, there's a whole bunch of things I've written about the, you know, Iran's gray zone activities that, you know, might provide a little more background. So. And again, that's the washingtoninstitute.org. Yes, yes. All right. Well, thank you so much. We've come to the close of our webinar. Thank you again, Mr. Eisenstadt, for speaking with Thanks. us today. My pleasure. Be well. Of course, for our stay healthy. Thank you so much, you too. And for our viewers and listeners, please join us Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for an update from Ashley Perry. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a great day. Okay. Okay. Thanks.